Welcome to the Business of Story podcast, where the world's best storytellers from business, Hollywood, and beyond teach you how to use stories to communicate and connect with your customers. The Business of Story is sponsored by ACT, the best-selling customer management software for small business, Oracle Marketing Cloud, helping businesses use the latest marketing technologies to tell their stories and connect with their customers. Sixter, allowing marketers to automatically inject clickable images called campaigns into every one of their employee email signatures to promote their company's most important initiatives or content. And by Zignal Labs, the real-time cross-media story tracking platform. Here's your host, Park Howell from Park & Co. And today's special Business of Story guest. Welcome, I'm Park Howell, and I'm so happy you're here with me today for this episode of Business of Story. You know, my job here is to connect you with the top storytelling minds in business who share tips and techniques to drive growth for your professional services firm through the power of story. That's what we do here at Business of Story, and we would love to do it with you. We're available to help you with story strategy consulting for your brand, webinars and workshops for your people, and speaking engagements for your gatherings. Our goal, either through this podcast or working with you one-on-one, -on -one, is to reignite your one true superpower, storytelling, so that you can truly nudge the world in any direction you choose. Now, you can learn more at our new Business of Story website at businessofstory.com, where we have a utility belt of storytelling tools for you to download, all to help you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And we have another amazing business storytelling guest on today's show. That is Kathy Cloat's guest. That's right, Kathy Cloat's guest, a seasoned marketing consultant, speaker, storytelling coach, and improv artist. And she shares many funny anecdotes from her work in B2B marketing, where she encounters the decided lack of storytelling. She also reminds us that we don't buy with our rational minds, we buy with our emotions, even in the B2B world, and that's where storytelling really comes in. On today's episode with Kathy, we'll explore why it's important to overcome your fear of storytelling in your B2B marketing to help you and your offering stand out. You'll also learn about the seven-step story spine that starts with, you guessed it, once upon a time, and how you can use this once upon a time format that is the DNA of our minds of how we are wired for story, how you can use it to build more powerful business-to-business -business stories. Finally, we'll also look at why you need to be able to articulate your B2B story in just one sentence. Airbnb does a wonderful job of this, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the show. Finally, there's a bonus. This is one of my favorite bonuses because you will learn my all-time favorite term for jargon that Kathy created. I use it everywhere, and people love it, so stay tuned for that. So without further ado, let's join my conversation with Kathy Cloat's guest on The Business of Story. Well, welcome to the show, Kathy. It's awesome to have you here on the Business of Story. I am so excited to be here, so thank you so much for having me. You know, I first came across you, I think, on Convince and Convert, uh, working with Jay and Jess and reading through um, an article or two or three that you may have had over there on their website, and I was really, uh, I, w I was intrigued by the work you're doing, especially having come out of Silicon Valley, as I understand it, but you bring very much of a, a, a humorous stand-up improv bent to storytelling in businesses. Is it, do I have that right? And can you give us a little bit of your backstory? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I, you know, there's to me, stand-up and improv are some of the best storytelling that happens today. And uh, so I came out of Silicon Valley, you're absolutely right, and I worked for some some companies you probably have heard of and uh, um, steeped in sort of a Silicon Valley culture. And, and you know, during the day I'd be, you know, marketing director and evening and weekends I have been doing improv and comedy for, you know, almost 20 years. And, and um, I thought, you know, there's a better way. Why are we not taking the emotional arcs and the emotional narratives that happen on stages and that's what really connects with audiences and why why are we 
so bad at that in business storytelling and, and why can't we marry these two? So it was always my dream to find a way um, to, to bring these two in alignment because I think the pragmatism of business storytelling needs the emotional arc of the stage and, the emo and you know what happens on a stage really isn't about sort of you know driving towards a business outcome and, and these two sort of can coexist and so that was my dream if not to just heal the, the fragmentation within myself. <laughs> And, and why do you think business to business marketing in particular is so bad at it? I think it's fear. I think you know so much of it is it's uh, a fear of vulnerability and that if we become human and if we do things in an emotional way that somehow um, it will backfire and that business is rational and we and you know that you know this apart from from your years of, of doing this it's I think there was a there was a long narratives sometimes die hard they, they have staying power and for years and years there was this ridiculous belief that you know all business is rational and that human beings are fundamentally rational creatures and we know, like predictably irrational Dan Ariely, we are the most irrational creatures on the planet. And we don't make rational decisions. We, we make emotional decisions first, and then we, we use logic to rationalize the decision. And now the science, the actual science, is, is showing that that in fact is true. So I think we're at this really interesting place where uh, people are now starting to go, whoa, um, storytelling needs to change and we actually need to be vulnerable. We need to talk about our challenges. We need to have an emotional arc. It's okay because we're human beings. And I think we're at this really interesting place and time of storytelling and it's really an exciting thing to watch. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And listening to that response, I keep thinking, I keep going back and you're sort of underscoring a premise that I, that I keep talking about a lot, and my listeners hear this a lot, is that we were all at the tops of our storytelling games when we were in kindergarten and it gets educated out of us, it gets shushed out of us, corporate environments tell us to, you know, be quiet, you know, do our thing, but the, but the thing that really strikes me is very, very few of us ever get educated on really how to communicate in yeah. the business world, unless you're an advertising major or a marketing major or a journalist. Um, but other than that, yeah. you can get your MBA and not have a clue how to actually own that boardroom when you get up to try to push a cause within an organization or if you're putting together a campaign to speak yeah. to you know, businesses out there. So it seems like you know, with what you're doing with the storytelling workshops, that there's a real need for that, especially in the B2B world. Oh, absolutely. And you just nailed it. And I'm chuckling over here because you're so, it, I mean, you, you, you could not be more right. It's, I've got an MBA, but I'll tell you something. Um, that and I think 250 will get me a gallon of gas because um, what I really learned about communicating didn't come from business school. It came from the years of me doing stand-up and from improv and actually performing and understanding what does it mean to engage an audience and what is the human narrative playing out that engrosses that audience and they want to see what happens and I learned more about how human beings think and feel and what creates an emotional narrative that's in, that's really enrapturing more there on the stage than I ever did in business school I mean that's for sure mm -hmm. And on your website, keepingahuman.com, you have a lot of really great tools and insights and I love the videos that you do um, <laughs> Are you using, uh, uh, what's the latest, uh, Blam? Uh, do I have that right? What's the latest tool out there? Blab. Blab. Blab, thank you. Blab. Is that, Blab. I was looking at solution storming biz breakthroughs. Is that yeah. down on Blab or is that on something else? That's actually on Blab. That's, it that's, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I guess uh, I'm not quite a Blaboholic, but I am uh, finding Blab to be a pretty fun tool, yeah. Well, I like it because of the give and take that you shared there, and what I want to ask if you would do for us today is talk a little bit about what you covered in that last episode about how you do use, and people can use improv in a very simple way, that whole concept of yes and, especially when you're just trying to spur um, opportunistic communications, as I call it. So you're not getting shut down at every idea, but you're keeping right. the opportunities open for a possibility. Right, yeah. Most of us go through our lives, yes, budding, and we do that at such a subconscious level. It's sort of a knee-jerk reaction. And we yes, but so many times in any given day that we're just not even aware we're doing it. And you know what it 
it feels like to be on the receiving end. So if we were having a conversation and, you know, if Jess and I were throwing around ideas and, um, you know, and you had an idea and then all of a sudden I said, ah, oh, yeah, but, you know, you didn't say yes because all that people hear is the but. And mm -hmm. after a while, I'm just going to stop coming up with ideas because, you know, I always like to joke that, you know, um, you can you can say yes but all you want, but a yes but is really a no masquerading in cheap perfume and costume jewelry. It's just a no. We all know that that's what it is. And so we shut down. And a yes and can, can literally change the dynamics of a conversation because when people feel heard, um, it spurs more ideas. So the yes and concept is a great way to come up with new ideas that you're just not going to um, get from traditional brainstorming. Uh, it, t it heightens. It takes you know these crazy ideas and builds on each other. And some of the ideas won't be viable, but you know when you use traditional brainstorming techniques, they won't be either. But yes and validates, builds on, and says I hear you. And that's yes and is is the, the the cornerstone of improv. That's how we create scenes on a stage is that we don't deny each other. Everything that somebody says to you is a gift. It's you have to. It's up to you as an improviser to fit that in to say yes and and go with it. And so it's a way to keep the narrative going instead of shutting it down, in which we're yes. all used to in the boardroom yes. or working in companies. Absolutely. Yeah, we did a. Um, I, I I don't know, Parky, you heard the exercise. I think I think we 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 forgot to record. We got excited, and I think we we start we hit record late. But what we did. I love that. By the way, you left out the exercise, but you did explain the fact that you left it out by not recording it. That's beautiful. But it was it was. <laughs> It was, hysteric. it was hysterical. We got so carried away that I think Lee's like, oh my god, we forgot to hit record. I was like, oh no. But, but basically what ended up happening is we did this yes and exercise and some, the challenge that somebody brought was how do I have more me time and how do I do all these things and take care of my exercise and, and meet with influencers or have podcast time. And we yes and at each other to, and it got to this place where this person ended up doing walking meetings, walking podcasts out in nature so she was getting self-care, getting exercise exercise, meeting new people, and she would meet somebody for a walk every Friday, and she would do a walking podcast. And those ideas never would have come out of this one little thing had Leaf and I just yes butted each other. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we took this kind of to this really interesting place, yeah. So Kathy, were you a stand-up improv artist first, and then a business communicator, or does one beget the other? Well, it's interesting because I actually um, started, my very first improv class was in college, and then I, you know, got my degree and uh, got that funds kind of sucked out of me and went into corporate America <laughs> and, uh, and worked in business and worked in marketing. And in the evenings, I was like, you know, I really want to pursue this because I really believe in my soul of souls. I've never found a communication device out there quite like improvisation and stand-up. I just haven't. And so I knew that I sort of had this capacity. And so um, while I, you know, worked as, you know, business manager, eventually became a marketing director, ran a team, all that stuff, was making decisions about content and branding, all these things, you know, in the evenings, on weekends, I had improv groups. I still have an improv group. I, I you know, did, did sketch at, at Second City. I did comedy sports and got my, sort of my education in real business communications out there on the stage the whole time I was doing my day job, I guess if you could say. <laughs> and in your day job then, so you've got these two worlds, this world where you're on stage and the stories are just happening all around you and you're having fun with improvising, and then you get back, I'm only going to assume, a very closed environment, closed-minded, uh, and being in the technology sector, as I think you said you were up in the Bay Area. What yep. were the challenges did you see when you went back into the businesses that they were just missing, like these great opportunities to be better communicators slash storytellers, but they wouldn't allow themselves. What what's the dichotomy between those two worlds? Um, there's a lot of really interesting. It's a great question because there's there's so many different things that I saw. I think one of the fundamental things that I saw, and I still see it, although I think it's starting to change. Thankfully, is this idea that somehow. Um, you know, if we talk in highfalutin sort of jargon, uh, because our competitors are doing it, we have to keep up with what they're doing, that somehow, um, if our marketing doesn't look like that, we're not in, in that same mindset or consideration set. And I used to say, and that's a bad thing? That's a, Standing out is a bad thing? 
And I couldn't, one of the biggest dichotomies was the clarity and communication and the simple communication of human relationships on a stage that was not playing out in business in, in every day. So for example, I would, I would use jargon or I would talk to you like um, you didn't have a human need. So if I'm talking to you and I'm trying to sell you something or I'm trying to convince you and I'm forgetting that, hey, here's a person who has a fear or maybe has a desire or maybe has a desire to be credible or visible and there's a human need driving everything they do and somehow I forget that that still operates and we don't check that at the door when we walk into a building that was the biggest issue because on the stage it's never about two people on a stage it's not what we're doing it's not that we're bowling or we're fishing it's the human relationship it's the conversation that we're having about who we are and what we want and on that stage every human being has a need and I need to find out what that person wants because every character has a want and a desire and a need. But that's not how we were talking to people in the business space. And so my head exploded and I, I had all these ideas and I was like, why can't we not just talk to each other like we're people? <laughs> um, that to me was just, I think, the, the hardest thing to navigate. Well, and, and it makes a, a great point because I've said this before too that um, – the B2B or business to business is the biggest misnomer in my mind in the marketing world because it's really yeah. B2P, business to people, or if you want to take it even deeper, if you have the guts, it's simply H2H. It's human yeah. beings selling to human beings in a business environment, and how do you do that? You don't do it with stats and facts. Let them right. drill down to the stats and facts once you've got them hooked, but you, you play that irrational, emotional mind and uh, let them know that you actually have something here that can help them in their journey you know, in, in their mission moving forward. You had said something earlier, too, that I liked, and I harken back to Vincent Stanley, who's the director of uh, philosophy at Patagonia, and he was one of our first guests here on Business of Story back in July or August. But when you were talking about um, the sameness, and you have to use the jargon because the technology companies feel like that's their price of entry, that they have yeah. to use the same words so people can say, okay, you're a part of the club. He pointed that very same thing out. He said the interesting things about startups and mid-market companies is they are so fearful of standing out, which is just is the ironic, ironic part of it. I mean, you want to stand out. You've got to have that differentiator. But for whatever reason, we are wired to, maybe it's that social being in us, is we want to kind of look and sound like everybody else in our industry because yeah. then that somehow makes us belong when in reality we want to disrupt that whole thing and we use story to do that. Well, it's so true, and it's funny because I, I had a vision in my head as you were talking, Park. It's like no matter how old we get, we still want to be the cool kids, and we don't want to eat lunch at the table by ourselves. We want to be, you know, we, it doesn't matter. We don't outgrow that. I think that's a fundamentally human thing. I think the other thing, and I wholeheartedly agree with, um, you know, your, your guest from Patagonia because it does happen, and I see that a lot. I think the other thing is that when you come out of, um, you know, every industry has its jargon, especially if it's complex, Every complex industry, whether it's financial, medical, you know, software, you know, high tech, whatever, has its its sort of its its jargon. And I think there's a tendency sometimes when we have very technical people who start companies, and I see this a lot, and I'm sure you do too, they start companies and they, they have risen through the technical engineering ranks. And then all of a sudden they have to act like salespeople and business people and communicators and marketers. And it's very hard to flip that switch. And in their minds, when they have what they believe to be a fundamentally complex, wonderful thing, they're so afraid to that, quote, unquote, they are dumbing it down. By creating a simple message, they are dumbing down their offering. And you, you have to work a little extra to get them to understand that, look, it's not about dumbing anything down. And that's, that's patronizing to your audience. What it is is you want to make sure that that message has a multiplier effect and simple ensures that people will tell your message. You want it to be accessible. But people, sometimes that technical background, and I see this a lot, can get in the way. Oh, yeah. Well, you, you've got the term, and I've been using it everywhere, and so everyone keeps attributing it to me, at least in my circles, and I have to say, no, I got this from Kathy Clote's guest, and it's <laughs> jargon monoxide. I just think it's the most wonderful term I've heard in a long time. Tell us about your version of jar, jargon monoxide. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I was at a conference. I was at a storage conference, so storage, you know. Storage. That's, that's beautiful. That's that, sexy. Yeah. yeah, that was, um, it, yeah, it's about as sexy as, um, you know, <laughs> as as routers and hubs can be. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> hang on to your libido, everybody. And, and 
I just came out of my mouth. It's just, I was talking and I was like, there's so much of this stuff and it, it's like jargon monoxide and the audience just busted a gut and they just laughed. And it was, it was sort of this recognition that, you know, here's the funny part. I'm in a room of marketers. Everybody like hands went up when I said, who hates creating this stuff? And everybody's hand went up. And it's like, here's the dichotomy. Everybody agrees that it's jargon monoxide and everybody agrees that it's bad because it's, it's a pollutant. In, in the way it gets in the way of you connecting with your audience and yet why are we still doing it so all these marketers agreed that it's bad and nobody wants to suffer from jargon monoxide poisoning as I always joke but yet everybody feels like oh my god I still feel the pressure to create it and it doesn't work and nobody likes doing it and that was the interesting part yeah yeah the jargon they're shortcuts that everybody in the room knows, but everybody outside of the room doesn't know and I guess by using it, it's a little bit of that badge of honor that says you belong, but you are are speaking to the wrong audience when you've got when you're using jargon. the rest of us are just like, what what are they talking about yeah totally totally and it it, it doesn't matter if you know and you you know this park it's like it doesn't matter if we know because we're not designing for ourselves but if if our if our message can't carry and it doesn't have legs and it doesn't mean anything to the people who are trying to receive it, then what's the point so you can be as smart as you want and you can take you know to the people who worry about dumbing down their message you can that's all fine and willing and good, but if you're do you, do you want to be right or do you want to be successful? Do you want your message to have legs or do you want to just be, have your little, your little area of the world that nobody understands? I mean, what are you in business for? And if you're in business to help people and you have a product that can fundamentally help people, then who cares whether it's in your words, but if it's, it should be in the words of the customer and how they need to hear it. Yeah, absolutely, and I think one other thing about this is that companies look at companies and say, here's how I can help solve your company problem, and they don't drill down far enough into saying, you know, here's actually how I can solve your individual executive problem. With oh, this. yeah. You know, and for some reason, there's that there's that, that breaking point that we it's really difficult to get people through, get them past the building, get them past the company, but get them down to the executive. That's human being. Absolutely. You know, I, I, it's such an important thing that I think we miss all the time is that I think our job as marketers and storytellers is that we're operating at, at two levels. I have to, it's a checkoff, I have to solve your, your, your company problem. I have to. It's, it's sort of a rational, just to have table stakes to be considered. I have to. But there's this whole other layer that, you know, I'm talking to a human being that feels risk. If, if the solution doesn't work as promised, this person, he or she feels risk. It's their reputation. It's their credibility. It's their visibility in the organization. There's a, cert, there's a human need that is just, you know, a hot potato and nobody addresses it. And so you have to tell that story that not only addresses the company need, but how am I going to make your individual life better? And you, you, you cannot forget about that second layer of story because it's, that is the difference. I fundamentally believe of, of, of really whether you connect or not if you go to that secondary layer and, and most business storytelling is really really bad at that. Yeah without question they just simply haven't been taught to do it but I think there's more and more folks like us out there that are teaching professional services firms how to do that on a business to business level and humanize the brand and humanize the offering so they are dealing instead of B2B H2H. Yeah yeah absolutely. You know, Earlier, you gave us that uh, nice little example of the yes and. We need to take a break right now. We get to take a break right now for our wonderful sponsors that help make business of story possible. But when we get back, you've got a terrific uh, uh, post on your website about the story spine and yeah. how people can easily use this very simple step-by-step -step process to create stories in their businesses. So when we come back after this message from our sponsors, let's have you tell us about the story spine. You got it. All right, be back right after this. Are you keeping track of sales leads in a spreadsheet or worse, post-it notes all over your desk? Well, there's a better way and it doesn't involve spending a fortune on complex CRM software. For over 25 years, ACT has been the number one best-selling contact and customer management software. It's super affordable and easy to use. ACT helps individuals, small businesses, and sales teams organize prospect and customer details in just one place. It also helps you market products and services more effectively, and most importantly, it drives sales. 
Triact for 30 days by visiting actstory.com and sign up for a chance to win a pair of Bose QuietComfort 20i acoustic noise canceling headphones, a $299 value. Again, that's actstory.com. Welcome back to Business of Story and our guest today, Kathy Cloat's guest, who is a marketing consultant, speaker, storyteller extraordinaire, and a very funny improv artist. So it's great to have you on the show, Kathy. Well, thank you. I'm just excited that you put improv artists, and you said funny too, so I'm just like, it's my lucky day. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, we've been talking a lot about story and how, as you said, you know, bring this current of story back into the business realm, or really maybe introduce it into the business realm for the very first time after all these years. Um, you've got uh, an approach, and it's not uniquely your own. We've all kind of followed up, but I really like how you covered it on your um, website about the story spine and how people can follow this very simple step to start assembling their stories. Can you tell us a little bit about the story spine? Oh, absolutely. The story spine um, comes from the world of, of uh, theater, actually, and that's where I learned it. So the funny thing is, people people say all the time, what's theater got to do with storytelling? Well, you know that story spine that you use? That's imp that comes from improvisation, and their minds are blown. Um, so it was, it was created by a gentleman uh, by the name of, of Ken Adams. I want to give a uh, you know, shout-out there. Um, and it was it's this idea that Throughout history and across cultures, there's something universal about the once upon a time model because it's the way that our brains are wired to think in story because we just are. That's part of our DNA. So it's this concept and it's a seven step model that says, you know, once upon a time, uh, this happened, this was the, the issue, the status quo. And every day, this person would do, you know, whatever they would do. Um, and every day they would do this until one day there's a disruption. The status quo is broken. Something has changed. And because of that, then this happened. And because of that, this happened. And because of that, this happened. Until one day, ah, disruption again. Now there's a solution to the problem. Until one day, da 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 da. And then the final step is, and ever since that day, they did this, blah, blah, blah. And it's that container, it's called the story spine because you really need to flesh it out. And, and, you know, I like it because I think it's sort of storytelling for people who maybe don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And when, when you get more sophisticated about your story, you certainly have to flesh it out. And you don't literally have to say once upon a time, wouldn't that be nice if we did? But, but it's a great way to think about it because the story spine thinks through every part of a great story arc and what has to be there. So if you're missing, you know, the disruption, and then one day this happened, or if you're missing that ever since this day they were left better off because of this, or if you're missing that because of that, then this happened and then this happened, that's a problem because you assume that your audience knows that if you tell a story about fixing a customer's problem that all the good things that happen later can be attributed to that product, but your customer may not follow that. So it's it's a way of thinking about how to tell that story that has people on the edge of their seat. What happened then? And then what happened? And then what happened? So it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's really nice. It reminds me a little bit, you, you've got seven steps here, but it reminds me of the and button therefore that uh, Randy Olson talks about that he actually lifted from uh, South Park fame. And oh, cool. it's yeah, it's you know, such and such is going on, and this is happening, but then this uh, happened, and therefore yeah. this happened. It's you know, your, your typical setup, conflict, yeah. resolution. And exactly. in business, you know, in business today, uh, they love to leave out the conflict, and that's the thing that we talk about a lot here yes. is you have to have conflict because only within conflict is there growth and change to deal with that conflict. That's exactly right, and that's one of the things I think stage storytelling is so good at. Um, we, call, we call it um, a status shift, uh, an arc. By the end of a, a scene in improv, somebody or, or multiple people have to have changed. In other words, the relationship is never the same. They are two people, if you're watching a 30-minute play of two people, who they are in the beginning of that can't be who they are to each other at the end of that arc. There's a change, and I think one of the things that, that business storytelling forgets about is that the change needs to be significant, but you can't have change without conflict. And you're exactly right. We leave out conflict because I think a lot of businesses are afraid to admit that maybe there's conflict or that they're not perfect or that they're vulnerable. And I'm telling you, if you have a story without conflict, you don't have a story. And a story without 
a quasi story without any conflict is a really, really crappy story. <laughs> I mean, nobody cares because if everybody's perfect, then there's no challenge. Where's the story? Where's we don't see ourselves in that because, you know, if it's if it's a, a simple hey, a, a, a customer had a need and we went in there and we solved the problem. We're so great and we made them look like heroes. The end. Perfect bow ending. Ta-da! Well, that's kind of an unsatisfying, crappy story. You know? Without a doubt. I mean, it's impossible to sell into status quo. Yeah. So something has to be changing to make your product or service relevant, or you have to be making something change to make your product or service relevant. Otherwise, it's just status quo, and, and as you said, there is no story within status quo. Yeah. Do you yeah. have a good example of a business or something that you've seen or worked with that has used this story spine and put it into play in their, their marketing? Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, there's an IT company, um, and without permission, I won't name it, but there was an IT company I was working with, and we actually used this model because one of the things that was really important is that, um, you know, IT services, you're, you're in an undifferentiated, hyper-competitive industry. Um, you know, there's a lot of IT services out there, and mm -hmm. um, nobody ever notices um, that IT is important until something breaks. So this IT services company was trying to say that they were different because of people and it was all about their people, but their story didn't, um, you know, talk about that. So we, using the story spine, we uncovered a couple stories, and one of these stories was really powerful. It was one of their clients. Um, it was a sole prop, um, sole providership. Uh, the data uh, was hacked and compromised. And you're not talking about a business story. This is personal. This is somebody's livelihood. This is their baby. So now there's that secondary layer of this, this woman was not only about to lose her business, she was about to lose her high livelihood, her personal reputation. And what ended up happening was through this story spine, they uncovered that not only was it, oh, gee, hey, we win, we fixed their problem. Uh-uh. Their people, they had three IT professionals working for a week, day and night, to restore this woman's data. They would go in, they would take her food, they would bring her Kleenex when she cried, they would walk her through everything, and they got her up and running in a week. They restored her data. Now, I can tell you that they came in and they did their little IT magic and got her back up and running. That's a yawner and nobody cares. But if I tell you the emotional layer of she was going to lose everything, Right? She was at risk, but they came in, and not only did they, they, it wasn't even about the tools that they used, it was that people gave a crap and came in and treated their customers like people and held their hand and got them through this. And that was the story, using the, the story spine that came out of it. Because of this, this happened. Because of this, her credibility and her reputation were restored. And because of this, she could rest knowing that her livelihood was intact and that the her her customer data was secure and and so it was that one two punch and that's because we actually approached it using the story spine. Mm -hmm. I love the story story spine concept. We have something similar to it called the story cycle, and it's yeah. very much this ten step approach that the story spine actually takes you a little bit closer to writing your story. Our story yeah. cycle is about uh, pulling together all the meaningful content that you need to have to tell every engaging story, but then make it uniquely your own. So it's a, it's a form, it's not a formula. And I really like being able to use the story spine as that mm -hmm. next step then of actually authoring those stories because it's simple, very pragmatic, and as you had said earlier, it puts a structure around our narrative that our brains love, that our, our, our subconscious is all about, is actually looking for. Yeah, it, it really does. And, and you don't always have to, and this gets a little bit interesting, as you become a, a sort of more you know, comfortable storytelling, I, I always tell my clients, you can start in the middle. You don't always have to start right. once upon a time. But, but, but I think what is beautiful is the simplicity and the elegance. It's so simple, and it's easy to get your arms around it. So I think when all else fails, you know, I, I, it never fails to, to amaze me that the story spine is such a great place to, to start because it will help people uncover some of these stories, at least start to put structure to it. Yeah, I like that a lot. And as a part of our story cycle, chapter nine or, or, or content bucket nine is the moral of the story. And yeah. I have found actually that you don't have to wait until chapter nine to reveal the moral of your story. And in fact, I just I put a blog post up yesterday on LinkedIn, the, the one rule you must obey when crafting brand stories. And I simply started with the moral of the story. 
Yeah. Life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated, Confucius yeah. told us centuries ago. And <laughs> I had experienced that you know, the day before when I went in to make a presentation to a bunch of 7th and 8th graders in a very tough South Phoenix school. Oh. And I didn't simplify it enough. And it's not that they were dumb. It wasn't dumbing it down. Is it just I didn't have an appreciation for the audience I was talking to. And I went in with this big complicated thing, and I absolutely bombed. <laughs> But it, it went back to me. It's like, oh my God, I'm caught up in my own story jargon. I had to shake myself out of it. And knowing that you were going to be on the show this week, I had to laugh at myself that I was suffering from jargon monoxide in the story <laughs> world. It, it, was, it, it was obvious. It was painfully obvious to me as I worked with them for 90 minutes. And I always go in and say, you know, you, the whole idea about being a storyteller is to own the room. Well, I can tell you these 15 youngsters owned me for 90 yeah. minutes. It was tough, but it was a great learning experience. Oh, and kids are like the best audience for that because they have that no BS filter. And it's like, if it doesn't make sense, they're pretty direct about it. Like, like no, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, <laughs> it doesn't oh, yeah. make sense. But you're right. I mean, we do get caught up in, and sometimes, you know, I get caught up. It's like, oh, no, wait a minute. What am I doing? We all get caught up sometimes in what we're saying, and then we forget that Simpler is always better, and, and you know everybody has complexity in their life, and and the last thing they need you to do is add more complexity to their already crazy life. They are looking for you to make it simple. Please make it less painful. So when you make it more painful, they're like, oh man, you know. <laughs> without a doubt, without a doubt. Let's take one more break, but when we come back, Kathy, I would like to have you talk about since you're talking about simplicity, is what is a good way for a company to approach story strategy because of course you have to have a strategy to begin with before you know which stories that you actually want to craft and tell. Mm -hmm. So when we come back let's talk about story strategy. Did you know that on average each of us sends around 10,000 emails each year and what does each message include? Well an email signature right? Well, Angie's List realized the reach they had with their 270 employees and decided to use their email signatures to promote their flagship customer event called the Festival of Services. Angie's List dialed up Sigster to become mission control for its email signature campaign. In minutes, each employee had a Sigster-powered call to action in their email signature. In six months, the campaign had been viewed more than two million times resulting in 4,500 visits to the registration portal, or 38% of all visits, which meant Sixter drove more engagement than any other track marketing activity. Now, if you want to ignite the most ubiquitous and overlooked promotional channel in your business from one simple platform, visit Sixter.com. That's S-I-G-S-T-R.com. And see how they will help you message, measure, and manage your email signature marketing. Hey, if it's good enough for Angie, it's good enough for me. Your customers, employees, marketing campaigns, partners, and yes, your detractors, they're each telling a story right now about you. Where? On social media, in traditional print publications, in blog posts, on television, basically everywhere. And it's happening 24-7, in real time. Your mission? Track these stories and the sources that share them, smartly manage them, analyze them rapidly and discern what you should do next, what you should do now. No wonder you're tired. Well, Zigna Labs is a real-time cross-media story tracking platform that makes your life easier. Their solution enables customers to quickly spot trends, see relevant stories unfold, and take action. So stay ahead of what the world thinks with Zigna Labs. Learn more and sign up for a free demo at zignalabs.com forward slash story. Welcome back to the business of story and our guest today, Kathy Clotes Guest. As mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, a wonderful con story consultant, story artist, improv artist, and it's so great to have you on the show today. You know, everything from the improv side of life to you've taken us through that spine of story, so we have kind of an idea of the seven steps that one can use uh, to actually create their stories and uh, now I'd like to have you talk about how do you approach your clients around story strategy because we have to start at that 50,000 foot level before we yeah. can get down to ground level of storytelling but how do you make it simple? 
Yeah, that's always that's always the challenge, and it's gosh, you know this so well yeah, from the work you do. It's like, man, it, it, you know, it, it's simple is hard. You know, it, it, when when I see a simple story, I know how hard it was to get to that layer of simplicity because being verbose is much easier. And I think the way it starts is really, can you articulate, to me the litmus test is, can you articulate in one sentence, really, what you do, what you do. And that really is it for me. You can do as a business, you can do five or six different things, have you know, multiple business units, but I, I don't care. If it cannot roll up into one simple sentence about who you are in the world and what you do, I think that's where it starts. That's where the complexity starts to unravel. Because everything you do, if you're, if you're, you know, just as an example, um, you know, belong anywhere. Airbnb is such a simple belong anywhere message. Very simple. What's great about it is when you have simplicity at the highest level, at the 50,000 foot level, all your stories, everything you do from your content strategy to your tactical campaigns, whatever, should advance that story. It becomes the GPS through which you start to navigate your storytelling. And if it doesn't advance the story, then it's very simple to me. Don't do it. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't work because everything should support that bigger story. And, and I think that's really the crux of it. Can everything be in alignment at some level? Does it tie back to and advance our goal of belong anywhere, you know, if you're Airbnb? So it's a very simple litmus test, but I think it's a really important one that gets overlooked. And it sounds like that one sentence that you're talking about to be articulated is truly their value proposition. Yeah. And the question then is, uh, upon that first asking of what that one sentence is, how long does it take typically for your customers to get there, your clients to really be able to articulate that value proposition? Well, it's, I think it's more than a value proposition because I think it's bigger than that. It's bigger than the economic value. It goes to the human, the human thing, which is, you know, belong anywhere. That's, that's, that is, speaks to our, our human desire for freedom and for independence and for you know, being chained down to a particular location. So I think there's something bigger and you have to get to that bigger thing. So there's that, there's that. And I think it really depends. You know, some, some clients have a good sense of who they are in the world. But I've also seen the opposite where people had a fragmented content strategy and they had these one-off campaigns, but there was no common thread among the campaigns. And I step back and I say, well, what's the commonality? What's that big story arc that ties all these pieces together and they can't articulate it? Now that worries me. That worries mm -hmm. me. Because then it's clear to me that they don't have an overarching goal or GPS of who they are in the world and where where you know what they're what they're using to guide all their decisions through and that's where you kind of have to start so it just depends on if the clients clear on it or if it's not clear and what's even scarier is when you you go in and it happens and all the employees use a different one sentence for that and there's no consistency then you know you have a problem <laughs> yeah um, well, and I think it, it, it speaks to that basic problem we all have as human beings is we default to tactics. So it's like, yeah, yeah let's tell this story, let's tell this story, let's, you know, without doing the heavy lifting of stepping back and saying, no, wait, what is our meta story? What did, what did we yeah. all believe in? And yeah. I love your, your idea about Airbnb, belong anywhere. But I would imagine that they had to drill down to that. That didn't, that didn't just pop out of someone's mouth, that they had to really get their head around their culture what they did and what it meant to yeah. other people, you know. Um, yeah. And I think you're you're dead on. We we use Airbnb and some travel uh, overseas uh, last two summers, and it was just fantastic because you really do feel like you're belong in that home that you're staying at. The people are so great, and I you know even argue that you get that a little bit with Uber and Lyft. You you don't get picked up by some faceless taxi cab person. You get picked up by someone who actually starts telling you stories, and they cajole you all the way to wherever they're going to drop you off and so it's kind of this function of this new society we're living in and that leads me to this next question about Millennials and I'm seeing this yeah. more and more I would say and, and, and feel free to, you know to, to challenge me on this but it seems to me because of the Millennials and the growing population within industries and, and moving up into leadership roles that it is actually inciting more storytelling within organizations, whether they realize that or not. But it seems that it's the way this group of professionals prefer to be, you know, sold to or spoken with or interacted with. Would you agree with that? 
Oh, most definitely. It's such a generational thing too, because you know, you, you know, you can talk to a, a boomer executive, and sometimes there's still that fear of how much of the corporate veil do we, uh, you know, take down. And when you're talking to a millennial who maybe in a tech startup, for example, who's a founder. Well, it, it's so interesting because it's like, well, of course we're going to tell our stories. Of course we're going to be transparent. Of course we're going to be a little bit vulnerable about how we had to pivot and how, you know, our first idea didn't work. But here's why we're doing what we're doing. Here's we're going to be honest with you, customer, about why we're making these changes. And it's a very different mentality towards openness and transparency. And it's really a, a big shift. I think you're right. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot more of those, as you say, the boomer executives kind of scratching their head and, and I get a lot of these calls too is can you come in and help us with our story help us understand what the storytelling thing is about because we have yeah. so many more of these folks working for us but we're also yeah. selling to them a lot more yeah. you know my old guard that used to that was around before the recession is no longer around so I have to understand how do I interact with these you know this new and growing group of consumer out there and customer and storytelling seems to be that common thread that connects us all which is not ironic shouldn't be because it's been around since the beginning of time. We just, I think, decided in the generation of big brands and I'm going to just promote my stuff and disrupt your life and throw it on you that we got away from storytelling, but now it's come back and it's certainly technology and the internet has made it even more important and more potent to be a great storyteller and interact with people whether they're going to buy from you or not. Yeah, it's it's completely different. And you look at companies out there. You know, you you mentioned Patagonia. I mean, they've been doing this for a long time, but they're a great example. Warby Parker. You know what I mean? They yeah. do such great. I mean, and they're so popular with millennials. And the other thing that's different, and I think you know what has changed about storytelling is that corporate veil has come down. And I've written about this a lot, as you probably know. It's like you cannot be a great storyteller as a company and be like, the company did this. No, the company is not a protagonist because nobody cares about the company. Uh, you, you need to anchor that story through a human frame, so a human lens. So tell me of either about a customer or if it's going to be internally, maybe it's an employee or maybe it's um, an executive, but the executive can't be the hero. The executive needs to maybe exhibit some vulnerability about, hey, you know, we had to pivot and it was scary and we didn't know what we were doing and we were hoping it would work out. And and it's, but there has to be some human lens there for the storytelling. So I think that the old sort of industrial complex storytelling and in sort of a, of that other generation, that just doesn't work anymore. So you better, you better, if you're going to do storytelling effectively with millennials, you've got to anchor it through a very human lens. Ah, uh, the industrial complex of advertising <laughs> and promotion, the yep. big evil Death Star. Yeah, I love yep, it. Yep, yep, yep. Well, as we wrap up here today, Kathy, can you give our listeners a couple tips, techniques from you that can help them become better storytellers or hone their storytelling skills as soon as they click off of this podcast? What would you tell them? Well, I would definitely, definitely say, you know, keep it simple and, you know, the, the, the story spine is a great place to start. I love it. I just love the simplicity of it. And as you get more sophisticated, you can, you can expand it. You should. But at least it will help you with that skeleton and, and, and thinking through the arc. So I, I, that's one thing. Keep it really simple, super simple. I would also say um, I think there's this weird thing that happens in Silicon Valley and probably a lot of places where, People think that they have to have a super story that no one has ever thought of to have the Uber story, and like you know, they've got to have a superhuman, uh, you know, story. So they're, they they want the the story steroids. And my 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 feeling on that is, you know, don't underestimate the power of a simple, elegant, memorable, just pure story that's not that's honest and grounded in reality. So uh, that that's important. Look for the times that you know there was a there was a human need met. Get to the human need of that story, and if you if you start to peel back the onion about your services, you know what did you really provide at a human level for your customer? How was their life different? If you can tell that story of how their life was better, their life, not just their business, that's a story. That's where you should go. I love it. How their life was better, not their business, and it takes you from the B to B realm to the H to H realm, and that's where I think they all need to be. They all need to be. We're all just people. We don't check our human card at the door when we do business. I have never, ever done business with a robot. 
Um, they're all people, at least I believe 92.3% of them were. I don't know about the others, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, and it, the, the rules shouldn't be any different when, we, when you're doing it in a business capacity because it's always that person at the other end that we're selling to that has real fears and desires and needs. And let's just treat them like human. That's, that's what we should be doing. That's great. Kathy, besides your website, keepingithuman.com, where else can people get information from you and about you and the wonderful tools that you make available to them? Oh, I appreciate that. Well, we've, a lot of it is at my blog. Um, you can also go to my YouTube channel. I've got a lot of videos. I've got the Story DNA uh, podcast that I do. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, and it's at Kathy Clotes Guest, no hyphen. And, uh, yeah, that's, those are some of the, the big ones. And i got to tell you out there, follow her on Twitter because I have been able to pull more euphemisms that are fun around storytelling off of her Twitter feed than anybody else. Well, that's very sweet of you to say. I'm a big believer in, you know, comedy and improv, and I believe fundamentally that embrace your weird. So if you've got something in your bag of tricks that makes you different, like for me it's comedy and improv, then I'm sure going to use it, and i got tons of Kathyisms, and uh, that's just the way I'm wired. <laughs> Well, awesome. Kathy, thank you so much for being here with us today on Business of Story. And I uh, look forward to having you back again sometime when uh, we continue to follow our, our collective or our parallel storytelling journeys. You got it. Thanks so much for having me, Park. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for listening to this episode. I'll be back next week when we have another amazing guest like Kathy on, as a story artist that will help all of us in the professional services world humanize our B2B marketing and connect like you've never connected before to actually help your people, as Kathy said, enjoy a better life within our companies through the products and services you offer. And if you like what you're hearing on Business of Story, please go to iTunes and let us know. Share with your friends, subscribe, give us that five-star rating if we're up to it. Um, it helps us grow our audience, and we are all about helping as many people as we can out there in the world. And to help you for some free tools, go to businessofstory.com. There are plenty of free storytelling tools there. Have a fairly new item that you can download. Um, it takes you through the 10-step story cycle process, and it helps you write your personal, your founder story, if you will, to help you arrive at what Simon Sinek says, you know, why do you do what you do? So check that out at businessofstory.com. And thank you again for listening. And until next week, I'm Park Howell, and have a wonderful life. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Oracle Marketing Cloud, Park & Co., Sixter, Zignal Labs, and ACT, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts. Podcast imaging by audiopad.com.